Welcome, everybody. This is the Finance Committee of December 14th. Um, so we'll convene, call to order. Those present, um, Chris, Peter, Sean, um, and staff, and I don't, I don't know if we need to do others. Um, approval of minutes, it, it motion to approve the minutes. So Second. All those in favor? Uh, can I ask for just one edit correction on page five? Uh, Mr. Sanchez's name is spelled wrong. Uh, so we have to fix that. Someone was talking. Thank you for waiting. So approval with that with those edits. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So I guess um, what we wanted to do, and I think there's a great suggestion here that Chris was present has it really kind of dive down into we had some questions around the bond because it was pretty complex. So we had some stuff that was originally in our in our handouts, but it looks like Joe, you may have given us some new stuff, or is this the same stuff? Or it's, it's, it's the, the same, same stuff, stuff with updated markets change, and that was October 17th, and this yep. is December 13th. And I would have given this to you earlier, but I didn't get it until 7:07 last night. Yep. So now I'm just make copies of it, and then um, so here we are. Um, and, and this is not written in stone, but conceptually, and I think we're here to talk about concept rather than actual numbers, but it's sort of uh, just to give you numbers to look at. Yeah. And uh, the tax reform bill, and I'm Joe Katara from Northern Cabot, if anybody didn't know, um, would eliminate advanced refundings, which causes me uh, angst because uh, advanced refundings theoretically after the call date will reduce the amount of tax income out, out there versus leaving the old bonds out there. So you have four and a half percent bonds and they have two percent bonds. And so why would they object to that? The IRS code does not want tax income. If you understand that concept, you understand the code. Um, the other aspect is the escrow that we put the refunding proceeds in until the call date supports the treasury market, the one to three year treasury market, by billions of dollars. And, and so why is this here? And I think uh, Tom's discussion with Shanna is that they were, it's so complex and they're trying to simplify the code and get it down to maybe a few less pages that because of its complexity, they would just eliminate it because it's so hard to understand. And again, the code doesn't allow you to do things. The code prohibits you from doing things with exceptions. And you can't do this except this, except this. And, and advanced refunding has been a tool. To the extent that uh, the tax bill is passed and includes that, and both the Senate and the House versions included uh, the elimination of advanced refundings, um, there is some discussion that they might extend it until on or after July 1, 2018. So it was uh, the opportunity in our time frame because of January, just because of the markets changing, the Fed increasing rates as we sit here. Um, or even maybe to a year. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a hope with no real substance other than a hope. Uh, to the extent that advanced refundings are eliminated, this whole thing is moot. On the other hand, to the extent that it's not, or that we have the ability to do this, we're going to have to move so fast, like a blitzkrieg, that we want to be able to have everybody on the board early on. Uh, and this is why I approached uh, uh, the staff back in October. And, and we're hustling up the audit, we're hustling up this. We're and we're doing the CIP a little bit, a couple of months in advance, so that we're ready to go. Um, and um, we would do the public safety building and the CIP financing anyway, and we include the advanced refunding to enjoy the economy of scale of the rating and all of those things. Finally, uh, to the extent that the advanced refundings are eliminated, uh, the bonds are callable in 2020, 22, and 23, and uh, so that we can do a current refunding, and that would not be accept, uh, 
extinguished, uh, and the current refunding is if you refund prior debt and you use the refunding proceeds within 90 days, then you can refund it at all times. And this is what uh, we've done in the early uh, 2000s with a lot of the old State Street bonds. We did current refundings just to save money. Um, so, sorry, so, so can I get uh, so what do we gain by that? We just gain fewer payments, or do we get a present value return? Or? No, you gain the ability to do it as opposed to not do it. Okay. The expense is there's a cost of waiting. Right. That for those two, three, and four years, you're still paying four and a half percent in that debt right. instead of two and a half. So there's there's a it's it's not as good as this would be, but it's better than nothing. So is it uh, uh, call dates always 10 years out? They are. And so. what they're thinking of doing is they're shortening call dates to five years, but the market is resisting that like crazy. The investors want to make a commitment, and they'll accept a 10-year call for the bonds to 11 to 20 years, but they really are uh, reluctant to take anything shorter than that. Uh, plus, in terms of the way the bonds are priced, is the one to 10-year non-callable bonds are typically priced at a premium, which provides the revenue to pay the sales gross and the underwriting risk and all of those things to distribute the bonds. So the last 10 years, many times are offered at par or a discount. So you lose money in the 18-year bonds, but you made it up in the three-year bonds, and so it all works. A five-year call would really skew that. Do we have the option or do we have the ability to actually issue these bonds? Prior to December 31st, if that's there, definitely. Absolutely. And we talked about that, and we thought that we'd just take our our chances and see what happens, uh, because we don't have the audit. We don't have, and and I think that. So I was actually asked, do we have the ability to do it before the end of this month? You said absolutely. You did. You did. We don't. Well, you still could. I'd have to hustle like a bandit, but I can. Well, it, it probably we've got some other issues though. We've already issued uh, in, in the spring, so we've got ten million dollar exemption to worry about. Ah, yes, yes. So that, I, I don't think uh, even thank if it's you for that. physically possible, I don't think that, it's that would possible. endanger the spring financing. Yes. Uh, bank, uh, because those were deemed bank qualified, right. uh, and it, it would it would. And there's about $20 billion worth of advance financing now in December, so people paying a higher penalty that let's wait and see what we got. And I, the January investment is a time when rates are never lower because there's more money available to reinvest in the market because bonds maturing in January. So for a variety of reasons, we all decided, and I think the bank qualified aspect of it, was correct, was correct uh, really caused us a great angst when we talked about Council about it, and they agree that we really need to wait until January. Uh, if we have it, we have it. If we don't have it, then we still have our public safety building. And, and the other aspect is rather than have a crowded market in December, for the, and I would only do the refunding now and then do the public safety and CIP next January, in January, because those bonds can be up there for 20 years. So why pay a penalty just to get the advanced refunding in and combine it? But then doing two financings has its costs. So even if we're not able to do this, we'll have opportunity in two, three, or four years out to do current refunding. We'll consider to see what the that's where correct. It makes sense. And we'll and that evaluation the, at that the time. savings would be less than today's savings since the interest rates would be higher, but the bonds would be shorter in the yield curve. There's a quick pro quo. Um, what amount are we? What amount is up for call in two to three years? I can't. And I apologize. My phone my last. Well, if you look at the series, so there's three different series: 2010, 12, and 13. Yeah. So the 2010 are callable in 20, 2012 to 22, and then 23. So, so it's seven million five in 2010, mm -hmm. seven million one in 2012, and one million nine in 2013, or 2020. 22 or 23. Is it just that, or is that the amount of principal that will still be remaining when we are able to That's a power amount that we would be able to call. Okay. I'm sorry, what was the number? It's a very top line from 7185. Sorry. 7185. Or, and this is also interesting, is that 
if you want to have level savings throughout, then you're able to redeem less bonds than if you had upfront savings because the way the <coughs> matrix works in terms of how to, you can't have a negative savings. And so we're actually able to, uh, in a level savings throughout scenario, we're able to refund 10.6 million bonds. But if we had the upfront savings, we'd be able to refund 12.7 million. Because what we're able to do is... This is option one and this is option two. Yeah, because the level savings... savings from loaded savings. Because the, 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 the difference or the distinction is that if we want to have upfront savings, we're able to refund some non callable bonds and still provide economic benefit. But if we, we find a non-call bonds in a level savings environment, we would have negative savings for the non-callable bonds, so we can't do that. Um, so I don't want to go too fast, but I also don't want to uh, belabor. Now, for your edification, I've also given you two supplemental sheets that are the background of these, because they show each series, they show present value, they show the absolute uh, present value savings. Currently, if we did a upfront savings in today's market, the present value savings is 584,000. If we did it with a uh, level throughout, it's 570,000. So it's about a $14,000 difference. Where, where is that, Jim? I'm um, sorry, sir. At the bottom. Okay, no, I'm just looking for where you Okay, if you did a level savings, yeah. then your present value is going to be 569000 And in this case, uh, with upfront savings, it would be 584000 So this is flipped then from the October? No, it's not, everything stayed the same. The, the, the October, which is right here, still gave us a greater amount of present value savings, but at that point in time, it was $16,000 instead of $14,000. So conceptually, it's the same. So in October, um, scenario one is um, advance from the from this sheet here. Right? Scenario one is advance refunding. Is that what you're saying? All of these, yes. They're all. Oh, so this so whole thing is advance refunding. So series series three isn't isn't the the level level settings of like oh scenario one is levels throughout. Okay. And scenario three are the yeah. upfront savings. Gotcha. Okay, but, thank you. But on this document, which was October 17th, right? Yes. And I think that's what yeah. Larissa was asking. The one where we have the upfront savings, they lower that present value than the level savings. The net present value was 542. And that also exists here. Right, that's what I was saying. We have, we have reversed them. No. Okay. No. In, in well, what you just showed us shows a, shows a net present value of 584000 Oh. For advance. Larissa, yes. I stand corrected. Thank you. That's fine. The reason is because in these scenarios, which, which, which we're in outcome? October 17th, yeah. at that time, we're able to refund more of the level savings bonds than we're able to refund now. So yeah, this is 13, on. 13 million. Yeah. So if you look at scenario one, it's 12.8 versus 13.1. <coughs> now, it's 10.6 and 12.2. Yeah. So the differential here was like, what, uh, $250,000. The differential here is a couple of million. So. The, the numbers have changed, and yes, you're correct that it's flipped in that regard, but it flipped because the par value has flipped. So taking that into consideration, then, yes. looking at not October, back to current situation, so we see Raymond James scenarios here, right? Yes. Um, just to be clear, with, with level savings, we're looking at 569000 with advanced upfront Refunding, we're looking at 584000 Yep. Okay. The other thing I just encourage you to think about, and it had a lot to do with why I recommend the front load, um, is how it affects debt service and affects some of our near term budget challenges. Um, 
know that we're going to have some challenges over the next couple of budget cycles and you know, whatever we can do to help, uh, help that situation, I think we at least should consider. And is that because the receipt of the money will be into the next fiscal year? Is predominantly in FY19, yes. And that goes to page two of the memo that I provided to you at the council meeting yeah. that shows. And, and again, what's interesting is it, another thing of debt per capita as par values. Yeah. Well, you've got to look at total debt service. So debt service at four and a half percent, we the debt service with some four and a half and some two and a half. And so that's why this matrix changes a bit, levels us down in these three years, as we have discussed. Now, I will tell you, I have absolutely no preference. Uh, I've just put data in front of you. Thank goodness, I don't have to worry about policy. That's your prerogative. And I will do what you tell me. But I just want to put data in front of you to make a, a reasonable decision. So can I just ask a clarifying question? What I'm calling option two, which is the front load, yes. and this is the December 17th information. Yeah. If you look at the uh, amortization schedule down below, it identifies You're get 400 value savings on the far right column. So in, uh, it says six, uh, June 30th, 18, it's 136,000. June 30th, 19, it's uh, 353. Is that the actual debt service savings that we would enjoy? No, the savings is, he the absolute dollars is savings. I beg your pardon, I see it. And then the present one. value, um, this is the present value. So the column next to it is the actual amount we'd save, and then yes, that's translated right. to present value is the last column. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what's so down at the bottom of that exhibit, right. the new thing that's added, you got present value of savings okay. from cash flow plus refund. Then you've got an adjustment here of refunding funds on hand. Is that down at the bottom? Round in. Round in. That we're able to. We fund the bonds, put it in escrow, but we can't buy 5,157 treasuries, and so that's cash. Gotcha. Okay. So I just, again, I want to be clear, because this, this changes the scenario from what we looked at in October. Well, we, because when we looked at in October, I was under the impression that if we if we front-end loaded everything, yes, we would see, we would realize the savings of, of, uh, of 542,698. Yep. But if we did level, if we leveled it out and let it ride, we'd actually receive more saving, more present value savings if we delayed. Now I'm hearing that that's the reverse now, if I'm understanding it correctly. Where, based on the new scenario, advanced uh, um, advanced refinancing is going to give us a net present value savings of 584, and if we let it ride out, we're looking at still savings, but it's it's less. It's less. Because you're 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 okay. funding less bonds. Sure. And, and that's because the one to two point to five year treasury market has gone from a 0.5% in one year to about a 1.2%. The long end of the market has gone from a 280 down to a 270. What's going to happen with the Fed though, raising rates again? They've already announced that. That's going to increase the rates in the short end even yeah. more because yeah. the, the discount rate, or the Fed funds rate is the overnight borrowings between banks, yeah. and so it's a short term money market rate, but it is a basis for which rates. Uh, shift, but um, so the, the the we're almost seeing a flat yield curve. We're seeing about 60 basis points between two years and 30 years, where we saw about 150 basis mm -hmm. points in a normal market. In the short of the market, everybody nobody had anything to do with it. They want to stay short. They don't want to invest in you know long bonds at 2.8 percent. But now as things are shifting, uh, and so that's why these dynamics change. Yeah, I, I get three kind of questions. So right. I don't know this what you're doing, I just, but I don't know what you're doing now, but if I go back to what you did distribute to us yes. in October, yes. Yeah. Yes. You, you attached on the front page, which was great, is just but explaining yes. some things yes. using different yes. interest rates. Yes. And you also yes. included um, what insurers are looking for. Yes. Just looking at what new risk. So Six there was one ratio here where it's saying refunding efficiencies. They say that the, the threshold is really the baseline is 65%. We're just barely over that threshold. So 
I mean, that, that's sort of yes. And and then I uh, in asking uh, my colleagues that they are saying that I was a little bit too conservative and that it's the negative arbitrage is 65 to 90. Every kind of efficiency is many times that we had 50 percent or higher, and I probably should have put 50 percent. But the fact is, it's it's you're in. If you hit the 65 percent threshold, you're in. They right. But, efficiency. Yeah. I, I guess I was just trying to better understand. I mean, it, right. So the, the 65 is sort of the floor, and we're at 68. Is that should that be any reason of concern for us? No. Okay. No. Why? See, the only way you can change that. Is that takes consideration the is to delay the settlement for a year, so that instead of having two years to your call date, you have one year. Or <coughs> uh, um, is a differential between open market securities and slugs. Slugs are state and local government securities, and they are at a yield at which you can invest the escrow as at the bond yield or less. And the open market securities typically are 10 to 20 basis points higher yielding. The reason we don't use open market securities is because you have a tremendous amount of thresholds to follow. Uh, you have to have three bidders. You have to make sure that there's a uh, present value difference between slugs and that. And it, it, it's a lot of hoops. And for the hoops, quite frankly, um, it's, it's, it's fairly arduous. But if you want to squeeze out every single penny, you might save another $40,000 in your escrow by buying open market securities, which I mentioned here, versus uh, slots. It turns out, in addition to the tax bill, the slugs window has closed. It closed uh, a week ago Monday uh, and was only, uh, and it's still closed because, as you might have seen, the government ran out of debt ceiling and extended it for what about two weeks? Yeah. And they were going to have to so the slugs are not going to open until we have a substantial amount of debt ceiling. Because a certain amount of things the Treasury has to do um, uh, for you know uh, federal highway funds and there's certain things it has to do. Right. So the the refunding efficiency, the only way you can improve that is to have a shorter period of time between the Settlement date of the refunding bonds, and you can't refund bonds today and close them in a year. So you have to buy a forward contract and a swap. Now we don't want to be doing those things. But again, the refund efficiency should have been 50 percent, not 65. I hear. Okay. Uh, but still, if it's 68, then it's over your threshold of 65. Yeah. Well, my other question, though, the bigger question for me is: so that there's on the same exhibit that you had. That I have a run into this term, but you've got this thing called negative arbitrage efficiency. And uh, it's on, looks like that's not all which. Negative. And um, so, when I, so when I did it, and I looked at your exhibit that you gave us, the summary of refunding results, mm -hmm. that comes in at 58%, at least if I think I did my calculations right, which means that's below the threshold. So. Does it still make sense? What is what does that mean? And what I'm looking at is you gave us an exhibit that says summary of refunding results, general obligation funding bonds, the value of negative negative arbitrage is 437. The net present value was this this is what I'm looking at. This is what I did. Yeah, yeah. So if that I've seen I've seen sixty seven percent. Something this So I use the numbers here. According to the formula, you're supposed to have a negative arbitrage. Um, whatever. Well, so I just came out. I just wondered what's the significance of that. Okay. Um, I was approached by the kind of great to refund it. And I said, yes, we can refund the bonds. And I can save eight hundred thousand dollars. But I would have a hundred million dollars of negative arbitrage, and so you really lose 200000 so it didn't make sense. Uh, in this scenario, you have a situation where your arbitrage, I see what the arbitrage amount is. It's a negative 464. Well, that's a negative 464, 
which comes out of the savings. So the savings would be 542 plus the 464. So you save $900,000, but you lose $400,000 in negative arbitrage, so your bottom line savings is $500,000. Yeah. Well, what's the net present value? Is that the... That... I mean, why is that ratio... But I, I try to do the calculation as it was described, and maybe I did the calculation wrong, but that's where it comes in at 58%. So it, it looks like you take the negative, at least with this exhibit, you took, I mean, you just use these numbers that were here. You take the negative arbitrage, you add the net price value that was shown here, and that comes in at 58%, which says it's below the threshold. So that is a warning flag for me, just saying, if that's the guidelines they look for, why are we promoting something that's below the guidelines? If, is that a warning sign? I don't know enough to know what that means. Yeah, um, the... Here, here are the numbers. I, I don't no, know. No, I, I, I see. I see. Um, Really, it's de minimis. It really is. 
And then just the last question I had is still going back, and this is the last day of the 17th that we started talking about that night piece. I'm still trying to understand. We've got par value of $30 million we're writing, or $31 million. And our, how are the under, how are the transactional fees accounted for? So if we're writing bonds for $30 million, are we really amortizing the, are we really borrowing for the transaction fees and we're amortizing them out over? Yes. And if we were able to do that is that you will, um, you will see that the bonds are being issued at a yield of, let's say, 2.5%. And let's say the transactional fees are three basis points, or zero, zero point three percent We're actually putting an interest rate of a 2.53% on the bonds the town will repay. And then the bonds are resold to investors at a lower yield. So by putting it into the interest rate, not only is it not a out-of-pocket expense this year, but by putting the interest rate, it's amortized over the life of the bonds, and theoretically, it's a present value benefit there because instead of paying $100,000 today, you're paying $100,000 over 20 years, which is like paying $80,000 today. The transactional costs are built in very similar to uh, Mortgage at 4% uh, with no points, or yeah. 3% with two points. The two points that have to come out of my pocket, as opposed to, or 3% with two points that I pay for out of pocket, or I finance it. Well, my APR is no longer 3%. It's 3% plus the value, so okay. it's probably 324. Right, so, uh, but this, this is where I got hung up last time. So, for, when you did these net present value calculations for us, you're taking those 300 or so thousand in transactional fees, building it into the bond amortization, and then you're comparing the bond amortization with the refinance prior to the prior financing, and however those differences shake out per year is the net present value back. Yeah, whatever your existing debt service is, gross basis, whatever you do, yeah. town yeah. has to pay the net refund, okay. and then we do the Two and a half percent had three basis points on it and charge you two point five three percent, of which three percent pays for the cost of three basis points pays for the cost of issuance and the two fifty, but you're you're really paying two fifty three. Then we compare the two fifty three versus a four and a half, not a two fifty versus two fifty three is yeah. all in. Let me ask you maybe simpler, at least for me to understand, all the net present value savings that you're reporting are net of negative arbitrage and transactional costs. That is correct. That's, that's what we're going to get. That's what's going on in the bank. That's it. It's yeah. bottom line. Yeah. Just bottom line, no. And if you had a call premium, you don't. Do you ever have uh, bond deals where they have <coughs> transactional costs out of pocket? Yeah, Portland Water. Mm -hmm. What's the benefit of that? They just they don't want to finance it? That's all? Yeah. But if we if we we finance it over 20 years of the bond, but then we call the bond in 10 years, do we in essence get a refund on the fees as well, right? Because we finance them, so we're paying in essence less than. You know, the bonds are sold. Right. Okay. But your three basis points are included in your purchase, in your percent, right? That's because we get that today mm -hmm. and spend that today. Mm -hmm. And you think they'll give us a rebate 10 years down the road? <laughs> no, I'm saying we've paid them, but we financed the payment. Right? Well, so right. instead of paying 100000 over 20 years, we paid 75000 over 10. And well, then at the end of the year, you know. So I got a mortgage in 3% on two points. I refinance it. Those two points are spent. <coughs> so, but yes, I am looking for a refund, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice try, though, bud. <laughs> so I guess, um, the bottom line, I guess, I'm, so where do we stand given it's mid-December, we've got tax changes maybe running through the mill tonight. Which one of these are we looking at doing and when, and what do you need from us? Oh, I give you a chronology that I would actually start working. We've had the first and second reading. Uh, the CIP. Uh, and actually, uh, I would have started December 6th on the process, and the first draft, the official statement, would be due out 
um, on December 15th, which is uh, which is a uh, Friday tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so that's why we're continuing to be cranking on getting the audit wrapped up. Because we're all which which audit is the back page audit? Yeah. No, yeah. This, yeah. this is the uh, CAFR comprehensive annual yeah. financial statement. Um, I my deadline is to have things by January 4th for a due diligence meeting. And even though the first draft isn't done December 15th, I still can make the January 4th deadline to have my two drafts and, and a document ready to be vetted by bond council in the town by January 4th. Then we've got rating calls. And those would be Financing, and we're going to finance the public safety building. Yeah, that's moving right. forward. And that has well, that, that is part that would anyway. happen anyway at the same happens. schedule. Anyway, yeah. the reason being that the January reinvestment and the fear of rising interest rates at an accelerating basis yeah, gotcha. cause us to want to come to the market sooner than later. Right. We normally do in April. That's kind of when we're that's our typical timeline for spring. <laughs> Get into council because if so, if the past law, if the tax law goes through as it's drafted right now, that takes away the option of doing the refunding unless they put in a provision that extends it. So that is that's correct. It. That's where we are. So, so, you so call we, your <laughs> but we're let's say hypothetically <coughs> that we had that benefit. How do you want to structure the financing? That's the well, that's yeah. That's what this question is. Right Assuming right. that we can do this, yeah. how would we? Which path do you want to take? So I mean, to me, it's it. We're, we're the, the decision is a lot easier now yeah, I think, sure because I, in my concern before was we were kind of, you know, I don't want to say we, we were taking the short end gains, but not the, the, the maximizing our return. If you will. Um, to me, it's very clear with the advance we're funding the way it's laid out here. All things, you know, being static right now. Um, I think we should we need to go with the advanced funding because that's I mean that makes sense financially and it also so it's all the budget right exactly so so the, I don't see the downside it's one case right right wrong right. 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 choice of words yeah. yeah. to upfront savings yeah right right yeah. or level level savings versus advanced if I'm upfront so I'm thinking if I recall the upfront is five eighty four the level savings is five sixty nine. So I'm saying the upfront, the advanced upfront is the way to go. So we need a motion for that? Uh, you really, you are, or are you? You, I don't think there's any action because the bond order authorizes the treasurer to set the terms and back and forth and all that. Treasurer and the town council chair. Yeah, but we don't want to have a situation that is not consistent with your um, absolute right. But we still want to vote of the finance committee sure. as to what your right. recommendation takes the time. Yeah. So yeah. it definitely is uh, appropriate to, to sure. have a motion at this point. Um, I think it's uh, self-explanatory. This is a very different scenario than what we were presented in October, and the decision to uh, up, you know get that up front is obvious. For me, though, uh, it's not really. It's um, what's the next step? And it's about the policy initiatives around the use of that funding, um, and what and how we're going to plan around that. Uh, given the challenges that we're faced with, and do we want to achieve other policy goals such as you know, what we've talked about in the past, you know, Absolutely. which including you know funding depreciation so that we don't necessarily have to bond as much money later yeah. on. So that's the bigger part of this question for me than the bond question itself. And just so I'm clear, this, these savings are going to go to bottom line fund balance, correct? Well, that's the easiest thing to do, really. That's what Bayby is saying. Is there another use of that? Well, well some, I think that some of the savings will go to the school. Uh, but in the form of fund balance, so correct. That's correct. Yeah. Everything will happen as through fiscal right. Whatever their portion is, they right. so right. 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 it's, it's unanticipated revenue. Yeah. Right. Was it in the budget? Now it's there. But 
<laughs> potentially once we divide which is right. town to school, yeah, yeah. there's a discussion to be had. School, you school, we have no say on No, but, but that's fine. I, I'm not, and I'm not concerned about that. I just, you know, I'm, I want to make sure that we know where this is going right now. I'm not saying, when it goes to, if it goes to fund balance, we, then we have that discussion. That's of, different. That's yeah, right. Sure. That's the chunk. <laughs> where yeah. do we, now what do we do with it? Um, but now you, you have to fund appreciation. Right. Well, so, so just, do you want to make a motion? I'll, I, I'll move approval of, um, I don't know which option this is, of the advanced uh, upfront option is presented. That's option two. Is that option two? I think, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut my second to Second of all. Be clear, that's first value savings uh, projected at five. Yeah. Five Correct. Five. Yes. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Yes. So you made a motion. I'll second that. All in favor. Great. Great. So just from a procedural aspect, so now this goes to the full council. For a vote? Doesn't, no, doesn't have to. Doesn't have to. No, typically these decisions are made uh, by staff and our consultants. This is the first time in my tenure with the town where the finance committee expressed interest in really kind of diving into the details of this. So that's where, I mean, um, having been around the longest, I don't think I've ever had this conversation at a finance committee level. So the question I have is whether or not we want to place something into precedent, whether it's by policy or whether it's, you know, what it, what, to have whether to have this every year. Be issue a bond, you know, what is the protocol going forward? Um, so it's not just an exercise that we did this year and then that's forgotten because the entire council changes in a couple of years. Don't you have a charter discussion on that in terms of authorizing uh, bonds? Yeah. Is it authorizing the bonds or are we talking specifically about it? <coughs> it's it's about the structure. How's the structure? Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think we have, I think, to Joe's point, I think we have a charter in place that, that grants authority to staff to do that. I think. You know, kudos to us for saying it all the time. We want to know what the heck's going on, and we right. want to be a little more involved with it. I think that's a prerogative of whatever whoever's sitting in the chairs at the time. Whether it's new debt that we're issuing or uh, current refunding or advanced refunding, we always come to you with a, uh, a scenario of you know mm -hmm. whether it's present savings or interest expense, you know, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So that really amounts to a staff recommendation. This is the yep. approach that we'd like to take. Right. Uh, when we did that, that's I think it was clear to flag out. There's some choices we, right. we recommended this one, and I think correctly we said, wait, let's take a second. Another year that it might be just the reverse of, of this. So I guess my point is that so we have a, um, a debt management policy or the new finance yeah, policy good, yeah. that we're in the process of whether or not that should be, maybe it's just a paragraph statement that talks about the finance committee being charged with that type of review, but it should be kind of you know codified into the yeah. policy. Yeah. For future reference. Yeah. Again, as long as I guess uh, my only concern, and I'm not, we, we, let me talk about it. Um, my only concern would be is if we do run up against get the deadlines with bond issuances and things like that, I don't know if we would necessarily slow the process down by getting involved and having layers of meetings of bureaucracy, or if we would have to structure it in a way that's timing is, you know, timing would be um, an, an issue. An, an yeah. issue. Yeah. It, it, it may not be, I don't know. I have to make an objective yeah. observation. Yeah. Totally out of order. Um, <laughs> we're used to that. Yeah, we're not very, <laughs> quiet, we're not very objective. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Being from the outside, when we did the school financing, uh, there was a tremendous amount of dialogue with who's the gentleman you know, Bob Mitchell. Bob Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, okay. that, that it seems to me that the transparency is paramount here, that uh, there seems to be a great interest beyond powers to create a communication uh, and, and, and it's, to the extent that you formalize it and fetter it, I think formalization is when powers aren't being uh, utilized with the communications, but to, to create, to your point, to, to create uh, too much structure. Like for example, the bond order allows the chairman of the board and the treasurer to set the terms and all that stuff. Tom's sensitivity to the advanced refunding portion and, and your obvious uh, interest in it caused us to step back for a minute. But I mean, that's uh, I, that's just my the appetite for having this conversation. The interest ebbs yeah. and, uh, and flows. Right. Uh, right. Well, it's, it's the budget. It, it's it. I mean, this. I, I, I think Tom's saying that ebbs and flows. depending on who's there. Who's there? Yeah. Who's there? Yeah. 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 Um, had, had no interest whatsoever of diving into this. So it's it's our job to anticipate what 
level of detail and interest. And so to that point, I, and I've, asked, I've asked this before, and I always seem to miss the dates. I would love to sit on the call meeting if I could, because I've never sat on one of those before. Yeah, me too. Um, sure. Just, and obviously, I know I can't talk. I just want to listen Still to the yeah. two years ago. So yeah. the radio call? Yeah. Well, you can talk. Yeah. No, 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 no. Don't ever say that. No, 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 no. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> This is where you're not supposed to be so objective. <laughs> yeah. We're not that flexible. If, if I understand, this conversation that we had today can actually happen after it's a policy decision and it has absolutely no right. impact on the issuance of the bond. Right. It's about what we want to do. So it shouldn't delay any future bonds that go out or that are decision. Well, we may, not have, we may not have to have reissuance discussions right. after tonight anyway. Yeah. So right. we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. True. Right. But in terms of timing, I can tell you the first thing that we ever see, whether it's new money or refunding um, bonds is Joe puts together a timeline that's very detailed. So we'll know whether there's time allowance for you know, yeah, the finance like we, we pushed for the <clears throat> first and second reading in December, where typically it wouldn't happen until like February, March. Yeah. And I think this one is somewhat unique. I think the uniqueness was there was such an impact potentially on next year's after budget conversations. Yeah. That, that was a particular interest. And in the shift in rates and the need to typically you borrow every March if you need to borrow every March. And you don't try to pick the market. Yeah. But this market is reacting in a manner in which it's accelerating and accelerating rate after mm. being stagnant for five years. There's an interest in the if we, had, if we can make, you have a whiff of uh, the tax bill at the time, and whether or not this was part of it. I mean, had we known at the time, we probably would have ramped things up and got them done by the end of this month. No, I guess, anyway. Okay. Um, well, the other agenda item was just to really talk about next meeting, if it works for everybody, we can, and I guess, you know, Bill, we need, we're looking for the final committee assignment, so it's still kind of in the Which but it should be the present committee. So we have, we have a motion? <laughs> So you can go ahead and, you can go ahead and schedule your next meeting with confidence. So, <laughs> so uh, no, I just wanted to suggest that maybe um, we get our other assignments as well because there's going to be conflicts no matter uh, dates, where yeah. you go across because we all serve on two, if not three, committees and liaison yeah. ships and all this other stuff. And Probably so. We'll secure the space. Just so yeah, just, yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's fine for them. And pair up your other commitments and we'll go from there. Uh, well, Thursday's I Thursday's work. To focus on? I was just going to ask any. I, we need to come back to the debt. The policy. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we yeah. started that work. Yeah. Your question really cues it up. But, yep. So I think that's I think that's that's a whole topic in itself. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of work there. Yep. Um, and that always seems to spin off in different directions. Oh, so that, yeah, that yeah, always does. Yeah, that always does. Your agenda. <laughs> I think if it, it that probably that, is at the next meeting, if we could also then start talking about the budget process. Sure. Do we have to for your benefit, uh, next Tuesday or the 19th, whatever that is, the joint finance yeah. is meeting again. We definitely think you should that. Um, and I think some things are going to start to come into focus. We've got a schedule that we're going to roll out to you, uh, some different process changes. So the timing might be great because I think by then the fine joint group will have had some conversation around what, how we're going to approach it, what we do doing differently this year. And I'm sorry to jump in, but have, have, actually, do we know, we don't know the makeup of communications yet, but did we extend the invitation to communications? Wasn't that supposed to be like all four committees together at once? It did. I mean, I did extend it, Kate, without knowing, I, I did, Katie's aware of it. Okay. Because it, some, I just assumed that until yeah. new assignments were made that that... Yeah, so I had the joint finance committee on the 19th. Yeah, we're supposed to also include the communications. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's Tuesday. Yeah. It's Tuesday, right? Tuesday, 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 Tues
So we've always handled our budget internally within this committee where we've done this across the table type of thing and there's been a presentation for our departments. And then we have this joint process where we work with the school board, which is really more about the presentation of their budget. It is next Tuesday's conversation about um, the budget process for the entire town or is it just strictly kind of a continuation of... Um, it's kind of macro level. When it's presented, what sort of process and timeline will the joint group kind of work through? Uh, I think there is a good conversation to be had. You as a town committee as right. to what level of review you want to undertake. Yeah. And I've seen some dialogue um, yeah. start in that, in that regard. I've put my senior staff on notice that there may be some changes this year that uh, we've been a well-heeled group that may not need the level of detail that others uh, do more kind of a higher level yeah. conversation. So we're ready to take the lead from you as to how you want to do that. Right. And again, I kind of you said that's probably on our next agenda item for yeah. our, our Yeah, and I, I think I wrote, I, I can't remember who yeah. I copied on, but I yeah. think that this town, we've come a long, long way where we used to, I mean, remember the little days, we literally went line by line by line in every darn department. Um, and we're getting finally to that strategic level where I'm hoping we talk about the value of our services and where we want to start cleaning and investing and how do we reach those goals which then become the benchmarks in our dashboard um, you know to supplement what we're already receiving so so, so just carving yeah. out a block of time you know the time after I present the budget to kind of second reading that's the five yeah. or six weeks that you have to do what you want to do but how you do it yeah. is important in some discussion he kept the leak out. So with that, um, uh, Larry, I think you're the only one from the public here. So for public comment, any any suggestions, comments? Uh, just a question on the on these two here. One is the up front, and then the other one's the level. But they don't appear to be apples to apples. The amount of financing in one is greater than in the other one. So I don't know how to compare them. When I look at the debt. The uh, ability to finance non callable bonds exists in the upfront savings. The ability to include those into a level saving scenario doesn't exist. So it depends on what your objectives are in terms of what, what so you'll have two or three years of non callable bonds, and then you'll have the following 10 years for each series be callable. Yeah. To the extent that you include the two, three, and four year non callable bonds or portions thereof, it depends upon the objective that you want. And the objective that we want is to have level uh, savings, then no non callable bonds can be refunded. If you want to have upfront savings, then some of the non callable bonds can be refunded because of the efficiencies there. Okay. That was the missing piece for me. Thank God the thing. computer does it, but <laughs> yeah. But when I was in college, we had to use key punch cards and the yeah. cardboard thing, so, oh, yeah. so, yeah. so I know how to program, so I understand what the computer is trying to tell me. Joe, when I was in college, I used to know my own phone number, but that's changed now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 there is Joe. Yeah. When I was in college, we didn't have our own phones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Uh, to I agree with the vote tonight. Is it moved to adjourn? Yeah. Second. 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 Yeah. Second